Today in this video, I am going to show you how to make a classic carpenter's sawhorse, just like the ones you see right here. I learned to make this sawhorse back in 1979 when I was a student in the building trades program at Alfred State College. Over the years, I have made many of these sawhorses. I've made them for myself. I've made them for different contractors that I worked for. I've made them for friends who are carpenters. I've made a lot of them. And I can tell you right now, this is a remarkable sawhorse. This sawhorse has three endearing features. First, it has legs that angle in two directions. They angle this way, and they angle this way. That compound angle gives this sawhorse incredible stability. It's not tippy. Endearing feature number two, the wide top provides an often useful work surface and at one and a half inches thick, it's a work surface that you can easily clamp things to. Endearing feature number three, these sawhorses are not bulky and heavy. They are relatively light. The weight to strength ratio on these is figuratively speaking off the charts. You can put one on top of the other like this and easily carry them. I do not recommend that you use these sawhorses as a scaffold or stepladder. But I can tell you that people who do own these kinds of sawhorses do use them for that purpose. The safer approach to scaffolding with these sawhorses is, of course, to put a plank across two of them, or two planks, or three. You've got the room for them, so play it safe. And there is also a bottom rail on these sawhorses. You can put planks on and walk on that if you don't need to be so high, but this is a good working height for this room. Over the years, I've developed a simple step-by-step -step process for making this sawhorse. It may look like a complicated sawhorse. It can be a complicated sawhorse, but it doesn't have to be a complicated sawhorse if you follow a step-by-step -step process that I'm going to show you in this video. I'm not going to show you how to make fine furniture sawhorses in a well-equipped dream shop because I don't have that. I'm going to show you instead how to make practical, functional, useful, beautiful classic carpenter sawhorses in this workspace right here. There is a companion PDF specifications download that goes with this video. The specifications package has exact measurements for pre-cutting each of the parts needed to make this sawhorse. It also has information about how to make this AB helper block, which you'll see me using throughout this presentation. This video has details that are not in the specifications package, and the specifications package has details that are not in this video. They go together. This is a fast-paced video. Here we go. We will begin the project outdoors by cutting a sawhorse top to length. The top is cut out of a two by six board. The next step is to rip a beveled edge on each side of the top. Here you see the helper block I'll be using through this project. The A angle on the helper block shows the correct bevel for the sides on the top. I'll be using my outdoor table saw to rip the top bevels. I bought this old craftsman saw back in the early 1980s. It's been used hard and it's been a great saw. The helper block helps get the proper blade angle. Set the saw fence and rip one beveled edge. Readjust the fence to rip the other bevel. Set the fence so that you end up with a width of five inches on the bottom, as you see right here. 
Save the angled cutoff strip. You'll be needing it shortly. I'm going to mark the notches for the legs in the top now. First, I measure four inches in from the end and draw a square line across. Then I use the helper block to mark out another line, as you see here. The helper block is three and a half inches wide, which is the width of the legs. I use the B angle on the helper block to mark each side of the leg notch. I use the helper block again to draw a line to mark the three quarter inch depth of the leg notch. I'm going to cut the leg notches in the top with my circular saw and I want to securely clamp the top to make the cuts. But it's hard to clamp the top when it's at an angle like you can see here. So this is where the angled cutoff strip that I ripped on my table saw comes into play. I use this strip to shim the 2x6 in a more upright position. Then I can clamp it in place. The swivel end with its rubber pad on this clamp allows me to get an adequate grip on the beveled edge. There you go. It's solid. I need to cut my leg notches precisely three quarters of an inch deep. I use the helper block to help set the blade depth on my saw. I'm cutting right to the line here, on one side of the notch, then the other. Then I'm making a series of random saw curves in between the outside cuts. I neglected to make a three quarter inch deep line on the bottom of the sawhorse top like I did earlier on the top side. Once that's done, I use a sharp chisel to slice and chop away some of the wood. I'm slicing down right along the pencil line. Then I flip the board over and do the same on the other side. Once I've pared away the wood along the penciled lines on the top and bottom, I use my chisel to finish the notch. A sharp blade is a real joy to use. If you've not yet seen my YouTube video showing how I easily and quickly sharpen chisels, you need to check it out. You won't be disappointed. I'll put a link in the description below. I use the helper block to make sure the notch is just right. You want the leg to fit snug, but not too snug. If there's a knot in the wood where your notch is, forget the chisel. Use your saw to make more curves and clear away the knot, like you see here. These are all the other pieces needed to make the sawhorse. They're all precisely pre-cut to size out of 1x4 pine. The dimensions are in my PDF specifications download. Those are the top braces with the A angle on each end. Those are the end rails with the A angle on each end. These right here are the front rails and they have the B angle on each end. These are the four legs. They are all cut the same, but they will be separated into rights and lefts and marked out differently. There's a square cut here on this end and on the opposite end, the bottom of the legs, there is a B angle. In addition to pre-cutting all the pieces, I like to mark, drill, and countersink where the assembly screws will be going. Here I'm marking a line 3 eighths of an inch from the edge on these top braces and end rails. Now I'm eyeing up and making a mark about 3 quarters of an inch from the top and bottom of the pieces. I have a YouTube video that shows how I freehand lines accurately like I'm doing here. It's titled, The Most Useful Carpentry Trick I Ever Learned. I'll put a link in the description below if you'd like to watch it. I usually use a 1 8 inch drill bit and a countersink bit like these. But for this video, I bought a number 8 Irwin countersinking bit like you see here. It's the right tool for the job but do not move the countersink down on the shaft like I did here. It's totally unnecessary and counterproductive. Leave it the way it comes in the package. So I drill and countersink where every screw will go. 
These are the front rails and they get marked out for screws differently. This stick has two marks where I need to draw lines. I hold the stick flush with the end of the rail and mark over one and three eighths inch and three and three quarters inch. Those dimensions are also on the back of the stick. If you look close, you will see three and seven eighths inches marked on my stick. Ignore that. If you make a similar marking stick, use three and three quarters inches. It's the better measurement. When you have your two marks, use the B angle on your helper block to mark lines. Hold the block flush and mark. Make cross marks on the lines at three quarters of an inch in from the edges, like I'm doing here. Then drill and countersink with that handy Irwin bit. Here are the four legs, all cut the same. They need to be separated into left and right legs and marked accordingly. This is very important. Page five of my specifications PDF shows exactly how the legs should be marked. The bottom of the legs have been cut with the B angle. We're gonna focus on marking and drilling the top. Here we have the top of the legs, which are cut square. You need to make three lines and drill one screw hole, like you see right here. Line one, line two, and line three. To make the job of marking four legs with the same measurements easier, I have another marking stick. This has the three dimensions shown in the specifications PDF. Make sure you place the stick and mark for your lines on the long side of the leg which is the side with the B angle point on the bottom. Right there, B angle point. Mark the three lines. Get your helper block with the B angle. Get the angle going in the same direction as on the bottom of the leg. Mark the lower line there. Then I have to flip the block to make the top two lines. When you flip the block, make sure the angle's in the right direction. All the angled lines should be parallel with the bottom angle. Then measure to the center and mark on the second line down for one screw. One hole for one screw for now. Mark and drill the other two legs in similar fashion, exactly as the specifications clearly show. Identify your right and left legs with an R and an L, like I've done here. I need to explain which legs are rights and which are lefts. When you look at the sawhorse like you're seeing it here, the leg on your right is a right leg and the leg on your left is a left. When you look at the sawhorse from where I'm standing, this right there is the right leg. Now keep an eye on that right leg when I turn the horse around. The same leg is a right leg from your viewpoint. And that's all there is to that. Now it's time to start putting the sawhorse together. I'm clamping the top in my workmate to hold it. So I'm gonna put the leg in the notch and it's not fitting. Turns out my helper block was a little narrower than the one by four I bought for the legs. This is no problem. Just take a block plane and shave the edge of the leg down until it fits. The top line on the leg needs to match up exactly with the top of the sawhorse. Move it into position. Then secure the leg with a single one and three quarter inch screw. Do the same on the other leg. And then again on the other side of the horse. The next step is to attach the end rails. I've reinforced the end rail with four screws like you see here. I use the Irwin number eight countersink to clear a hole for the one and three quarter inch screws. The end rails are positioned on the pencil line that was made on the leg. Get that right on. Make sure the end is flush 
then drive in the screws. Do the same on the other end of the rail. You'll probably have to flex the leg into position a little bit. Here you can see me bracing the leg against my body and pulling to get the leg flush on the end before putting the screw in. Use a sander to remove any little bit of the end rail that isn't perfectly flush with the leg. Despite your best efforts, there will probably be a little necessary leveling to do. Then reestablish any of the pencil line you removed when sanding. Now it's time to put on the front rails. The rail needs to be positioned exactly on the pencil line and it needs to be flush on the end. Your primary objective is to first line up at this point right there and drive in the nearest screw when it's right on. These screws are one and a quarter inches long. After that one screw is in place, make sure the top of the rail is exactly on the pencil line. Then drive the other screws into place. Sink them in good and tight. Here's a close up view. See the little triangle of end rail showing? That's okay. That's the way it's supposed to look. There's a similar triangle of end grain on the bottom, right there. Here I'm going to repeat the process on the other end. I've positioned myself so I can use my knee to push and flex the sawhorse leg into proper position. Flip the horse over and attach the other rail. This next step is optional. What I'm going to do is glue the legs in the notches. I begin by removing the single screw and spreading the leg. If the leg is loose in the notch, you may need to use something to wedge it out while you apply the glue. I like Gorilla Glue because it swells to fill any gaps. This old pallet knife and me go way back. It is a downright handy tool. Drive the screw back in. Then glue every leg in its notch in like manner. Next up, I'm going to put two more screws into each of the legs. To do this, I line my helper block up with the bottom of the sawhorse top. Then I eye up somewhere between 3 8 and 1 half inch and draw a straight line just like I'm showing you here. Then I eye up a couple of screw locations about three quarters of an inch in from each edge of the leg. The Irwin number eight countersink bit makes an ideal hole for the screws. Notice that I'm drilling for the screws straight into the top. The top screw was driven at more of an angle. I'm not doing that. Put the screws straight in. Repeat three more times on three more legs. Now I'm going to attach the top of braces. You can see that I have reinforced the piece with four screws like I did previously with the end rails. And you can see here that I have a gap on each side of the top brace. The two by top is not flat on the bottom. I could just leave the gaps and attach the brace and that's what I did. Then I changed my mind and took it off. That's much better. I let the Gorilla Glue cure overnight and used my sharp chisel to remove some of the excess as needed before this next step. I'm gonna cut the excess leg length off flush with the top of the sawhorse using a pull saw. But before I do that, I'm going to tape that thin piece of cardboard to the top. The cardboard will let me know if my saw starts tracking off course and is headed into the top of the sawhorse.
right there I can see that I'm getting off course. So I'll cut from the other side. Here's a close-up look at that cut. Now I'm going to show you my procedure for leveling the horse and marking the legs so I can cut them and have a stable horse at my desired height. I begin by putting the horse on a flat surface and seeing if there's any wobble. There's no wobble in this horse. It's good. If there was a little wobble, I would put a shim under the short leg. Next, I measure the height of the horse on both ends. I have 29 and a half inches on my right side. And I have 29 and 5 eighths inches on my left. That being the case, I'm going to place a shim under both legs on the right side to bring it up to match the left side. 29 and 5 eighths inches. Then I make sure that there's no wobble and I double check to make sure that the measurements are the same on both ends. Both ends are now the same height at 29 and 5 eighths inches and the horse is for all practical purposes level. I want the finished sawhorse to have a height of 29 inches. Therefore, in this instance, I need to scribe a cut line on the bottom of the legs at 5 eighths of an inch off the floor. To do this, I'm going to make a custom scribing tool by first measuring 5 eighths of an inch on a scrap of wood. Then, using that piece of wood, I'm going to configure a couple of shims and my pencil so that I have what I need. And there it is. Once that's done, it's a simple process to scribe each of the four legs. There's leg one, leg two, leg three, and leg four. I'll cut on those lines with my circular saw, but first I'll use my helper block to get the A angle on the saw. Let's take a closer look at those custom cuts. Very nice. This sawhorse is almost done. When I first started working in the building trades, I spent a lot of time making my first pair of classic carpenters sawhorses. I hadn't yet developed the simplified system I've just showed you. And I spent a lot of time sanding those first horses. Then I carefully painted my name across the front rails, and I finished the wood with a couple of coats of polyurethane. I wanted those horses to project an image of craftsmanship and quality, and that's exactly what they did. These days I make the horses a whole lot faster and easier, and with much less focus on the finished appearance. But the horses are still as strong and useful as ever, and I think they still communicate a message about my skills as a carpenter. This classic carpenter's sawhorse will do the same for you. I hope you've enjoyed this video and that you're inspired to make your own classic carpenter's sawhorses. The eight page specifications package is available at my Planet Whizbang website as a downloadable PDF. You can also purchase a paper copy if you prefer. I've put a link to the appropriate web page at Planet Whizbang in the description below. I've also put a few affiliate links and YouTube links that may be of interest to you. Finally, if you like this video, please share it with your social media friends. Hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my channel. And I thank you kindly.